Well, I'm finally back from my long fall conference marathon, and I've got a confession to make. I am conferenced out, and I am glad that uh, we won't have another conference until sometime next March down in Dallas. But we're, we're in a time of transition. We're in a time that God's doing a lot of things. And in the podcast and the videos to come, we'll be sharing a lot of that. Uh, the good news that we're on the other side of all the conferences, we can get back to regularly filming for Biblical Life TV and to get into the Word. Now, I want to do a little bit of review because we had covered the, the yucky fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh. And I want to get into the gifts of, or the uh, fruit of the Holy Spirit of abiding in Him. But I, God kind of took me just a little bit different way because I want to set the stage for this, for this to work right. Because I, I hear a lot of people talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but instead of fruit, I see nuts and flakes and a lot of other things. And so I want to start today in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 13. I think in the days ahead, our learning to abide in Messiah, abiding in Christ, is going to be essential for us to move forward. And so this is after the, the day of Pentecost. And I want you to notice what they say about Peter and John here. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, in other words, they had not been to seminary, they had not been to the either school of Hillel or school of Shammai, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You need to underline that in your Bibles. That is the essential thing to begin transforming your life you know I've noticed that uh, you know I've been at this a long time and I've seen a lot of Protestant theologians and I've even seen a lot of commandment keepers that are constantly laboring in the word yet they are not walking in the kingdom because the only way to really walk in the kingdom is you have to have fellowship with the king if you don't have fellowship with the king it's, it's not going to work. It's, it's, it's beating the air and they, they get frustrated and you end up becoming more legalistic or, or we begin explaining the way the word. I, I have gotten um, a little aggravated with a lot of modern theologians that try to explain away the word. You know, it's like Andrew Murray. When In Andrew Murray's life, he had, he had a dear friend that was working with him in ministry and the, the guy was really, really sick. He was on the point of death. And so Andrew Murray really pressed in, and God supernaturally healed him. And so Andrew Murray responded by writing a book on divine healing, trying to share with the body of Christ what he had discovered. And it began to sweep across Africa. And he was surprised at his own brethren, that because they would have people in their congregation say, oh, you know, Brother so-and-so, I'm, I'm fighting cancer. Would you pray for me? Or I've got this. Would you pray for me? The clergy in his own denomination, in his own church group, pressured him to take the book out of print because that was easier than finding out the secret of how he was able to tap into the power of God for his friend to be healed. And I, I see that a lot going on in, in various different ways. And what, I, what I'm sensing in my spirit is that God's wanting to take everything up to another level. We're going to walk the commandments of God by the power of the Holy Spirit the way that Jesus would, which also means that when we lay hands on the sick, we're going to get the same results that Jesus got. When we cast out demons, they're not going to play around. They're going to go just like Jesus did. The demons are going to say, Paul, I know Jesus. I know and I know you because I, I can sense him around you. And they go. It's time for us to raise the bar in this generation, not lower it. And the only way to do that is we have got to be with Jesus. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. When we lose ourselves in him, we begin to move in third heaven realities. Okay? Walking in the spirit and abiding in Christ are synonymous for walking in third heaven realities. 
So see, one of the things that we see the Apostle Paul dealing with, and sometimes it's kind of hard from the Greek, is it, is it spirit with a big S, spirit with a little S? Because the spirit wars against the flesh. How many know the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily need to war against the flesh because there would be no match? But your spirit does. The Holy Spirit's trying to empower your spirit. Now we've already dealt with in this series how that man is a tripartite being. That when he was created, he was created to function in all three heavens. And I also detailed in the Sherith Imperative, I've, I've dealt with it here, how that the soul is the bridge between the spirit and the flesh. And so the soul can take characteristics that we would say are fleshly, our carnality. How many know that when we say, my flesh is wanting something, it's not your body, it's your carnal nature. It's that part of the soul where the flesh and the soul touch, and they, and from the day that you were born, they've been in control. And second heaven properties... The principalities and powers have been training you to be cerebral, to, be, to, be, to move this only in, in carnal thoughts and carnal ideas and all these different things. And so all of a sudden you become born again and the soul is now connected to the spirit. You're connected to the third heaven. And up there where the bridge is connected is a new nature. But what the body, the way that we have taught Christianity is come, say this little prayer, sit down there. Now we have our own rules and regulations of what you're supposed to conform to to be within our group. And as long as you do these things, you can hold on to your Willy Wonka golden ticket and you'll make it to heaven. Because now that you're in, God can't even get you out. What we've not done is train them how to make that connection between the soul and the spirit so strong that the new nature becomes dominant and the old nature withers away. You see, you were created to live by the third heaven first. You were created that your spirit would be in control. It would be subordinate to your soul and to your flesh. But we're not trained to do that. You can't cast it out. You've got to crucify it. Come on. You've got to alter it onto the brazen altar as you get into the Word. And the Spirit of God is leading you. You begin to find out what needs to die in you and what needs to be made alive in you. We, the, the part of, of really developing the fruit of the Holy Spirit is to become spirit dominant. We need to become spiritual people. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to deal with some fun stuff this morning. I'm even going to deal with an elephant in the room as we read these scriptures. I know I've dealt with it many times, but I, I was looking up and, and doing some research in the commentary by Dr. David Stern. He brought out some really neat things. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I mean, that's good. You become spirit dominant, not flesh dominant. Okay? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would do. But, if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Oh, there's that, under the law, that means I get to take all the commandments of God and throw them away. That's not what we're talking about here. We need to realize you got to set what the Shammai Pharisees had done in the place in Acts chapter 15. And they created a system of law for the Gentiles that no Jew had to do. A Jew was circumcised not to get in covenant with God, but because they were in covenant with God. It was a sign of the covenant that had been established all the way back with Abraham. What they taught them that was faith in Jesus wasn't enough. There wasn't that greater circumcision of the heart. <coughs> it was of this flesh. And so I wanted to look up to see what Dr. St uh, Dr. David Stern has said. He says this is actually more better translated because in the Greek it uses upon uh, namo. 
The upon is is, is a tra- is, it, it literally is talking about legalism. Namo is translated the law. <coughs> but when you have up on instead of up on there in the Greek, it takes on like a sense of slavery. Okay? He said, this is better translated, you are not under legalism. Greek upon namon. Shaul uses the phrase discussed in, in length in Galatians chapter 3, the word namos, literally law, and often translated Torah in the, in the Jewish New Testament, must be rendered legalism, which is defined as a perversion of the Torah into a system of rules for earning God's praise without trusting, loving, or communing with God, the giver of the Torah. You see, what they did was something that was even foreign to the Jewish population. In fact, where it talks about the works of the law, there has now been archaeological uh, finds within the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that not only did the Shammai Pharisees tell them that they, they, they were going to be saved through circumcision rather than faith the Messiah, but they wrote a book of all the things that Gentiles had to do to be acceptable to the Jewish community, and it was called the works of the law. So without that, hist- without that archaeological document, we think that Paul is referring to doing the commandments when he's referring to a book that the Shammai Pharisees wrote that with them trying to take control of this whole Gentile movement within the, within the body of Christ. He goes on to say, under legalism, under grace. The word twice translated under in Greek upon means controlled by or in subjection to and opens the path to the slavery metaphor in the following verses. But in what sense are believers in subjection to grace in the sense that they have accepted Yeshua's yoke which is easy and light to be under in contrast to the yoke of legalism which is not? Being under grace is subjection which because of the nature of grace itself does not have the usual oppressive characteristics of subjection. God's people are to live in or un in in Hebrew within Torah, but they are not upon UPO in subjection to legalism. God's giving the Torah was itself an act of grace, which the New Testament compares with his sending Yeshua. God's people... The people who are trust, who have a trusting relationship with him are always, always have been under grace and under Torah, a gracious subjection, but never under legalism, a harsh subjection, bringing balance. So grace empowers me to walk the commandments of God, but it's not legalism that the minute that you mess up, God's going to destroy you, and it does not become slavery to the law. Law was always meant to be, because when, let's, let's, let's look at it when Moses gave them the law. They were delivered out of slavery, and God gave them freedom and grace and gave them the Torah. And Torah, which we translate law, literally means the loving instruction of the Father. But what men do with it? And let me tell you something, I have seen men take the New Testament and turn it into absolute bondage legalism to the place that you can't breathe. It's the way of the carnal nature. But when the Spirit breathes life into it by, that, by the grace of God, the Torah and everything from Genesis to Revelation becomes a freedom and a liberation to me, allowing me to live by the Spirit of God. I like that, don't you? Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. Do you know there is a righteousness of the law? And do you know those that trust in Christ, it's revealed in us? That's what the Apostle Paul says here, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? The Spirit. So there's a righteousness that manifests by a man who's been made alive in the Spirit because of the completed work of Messiah, that that righteousness 
of the law can be fulfilled in us or manifest in us as we're following the ways of God by the Spirit of God and not by the old carnal nature. Or not just by being cerebral. It's not just a bunch of laws and a bunch of rules and regulations. It's how the kingdom moves and how it operates. Compare the difference. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the, the Apostle Paul says we're supposed to live by the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. What's interesting is the, the basic motto of the school of Hillel that he graduated from was the spirit of the law. That was the way they taught it. The school of, of Shammai taught by the letter of the law, which he says kills because it wasn't by the spirit. And so we look at why, why did God say this? How am I supposed to live it? How does it honor him? How does it keep the devil out and bring the kingdom in? When we begin following in that, then all the word of God becomes life to us. You take out the spirit of God and you take out the spiritual side of things. I don't care if you're dealing from Matthew to Revelation only. You'll end up in legalism and it will destroy you. And finally, I want to, I want to settle this matter by just reading uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. Uh-oh. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So the law is spiritual. And if it's spiritual, the only way that it can be lived is by spiritual means. That was made possible through the completed work of Messiah. Now what are we supposed to do in all this? There's this war going on of the flesh and the spirit. And there's, there's in Ephesians chapter 4. I want to look at what the Apostle Paul tells us. Because <coughs> we've, we've got to put off a lot of our old ways. We've, we've got to, we have to have our souls saved by reading the word and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to understand it. But here he's dealing with, and, and I can almost see, you know, if, if the Apostle Paul was demonstrative, I can almost see him like wearing a toga, and then him taking it off and putting on a tally, putting off the old man, putting on the new, you know, to kind of represent Christ, because you can actually take a prayer shawl, and every square inch of it, you can teach Messiah about it. And he says, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust." And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? Where your spirit and your mind connect, you begin renewing, but based upon the relationship you have with Jesus, you begin renewing your mind to the word of God, and you let the spirit of God begin to make that word alive to you, and it begins overriding what the principalities and powers and the junk and the demons that were filling the people around you taught you life lessons. I mean, a lot of us have been taught lies in our lives. We've had people treat us bad, and we, th and we were told it was our fault when it was their problem, and it was the demons hanging out of their ears is the reason they had a problem with us. People have been abused, sexually abused, physically abused, and the perpetrator always says, it's your fault. No, it's not. It's their fault. But yet we believe those lies, or we believe the lies that, that we can't be loved, or that we, we don't have a right for the blessings of God. All these lies are that the only way you can get ahead in life is to cheat and to steal and to manipulate. Isn't that what this, uh, the spirit of Jezebel does if a woman or a man's been wounded? Well, you've got to manipulate everything. You've got to control everything. Well, you know what? I've bowed my knee to the one who controls the universe. I don't need to control. I need to submit to him and then he can control the things around me we, we got we got to learn to put these things off and let that let our minds be renewed there's a new way of acting there's a new way of thinking and I have found as I grow older in God that my attitude about a lot of things have changed over the years there's your priorities begin to change what used to be really important to you if, don't don't you look at that you know, now, you know, some of us are, are just in our, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and you look at things you thought as a teenager that you thought you were going to die over if you didn't have or you couldn't do. Or, and you look back now and think, oh, dear Lord, I was so stuck on stupid. I can't believe that I thought that. And it's the same thing. There's a transition in life 
that when it's like when you pass about 50, you go from this building and accumulating to leaving a legacy. And so you begin looking at things completely different. There's a place where you grow in God that things that used to really be temptations for you, it's like you're here, th th this thing the devil's trying to tempt you with will pull you down here, and where you are here has been too costly that this is no longer even a temptation anymore. Because you worked and you prayed and you believed and you crucified the flesh and you did all these things to get up to here, I know that John Wesley and many others looked at that. And they, they tried to define it as entire sanctification. They kind of confused it as you get up here and you get to a place where you can no longer sin. I think we can always sin if we, if we get stuck on stupid. But as a mature saint, you count the cost of everything. I mean, every time that, uh, because even in ministry, uh, in one week, I'll have people ask me to do enough stuff that would take 15 people three years to do. I have that happen every week. You need to teach on this. You need to write a book on this. Won't you write a book on this? Boy, this would really be good to write a book or do a seminar on this. You need to watch all these 72 videos and tell me what you think. I think I don't have time to because I have a king who gives me my assignments. And I have learned that if, if I make him happy, everything runs smooth. And so with every one of those situations, I weigh out, is it kingdom? Is it priority? Is it what he's calling for me to do? And if I do it, what other things do I need to put on hold? What other things may need to set on the back burner? Because there's only 24 hours a day and there's only so much Mike Lake to go around. And you begin weighing these things. And the same thing, if I, if I let things slide, now listen to me, if I let things slide, I don't begin praying the way that I should, and I don't begin really submitting to way, what is it going to cost me? What is it, it going to mess up in my life? What is it going to, where, where is it going to cost the growth that I have? Where is it going to slow down things God is telling me to do? And so you begin weighing all these things. That's a place of maturity. I have constantly put off the old man, and I'm finding new ways to put on Christ. And as I'm going to write in the, not this book, but the next book on, on unlocking the neshach of God, that there's an armory on the inside of you when you're born again. The Holy Spirit is the armorer. Now, I was in the military. Okay, and based upon your rating, your qualifications, and your maturity, you could be given a 45, an M16, it could have a grenade launcher, you could, you could be handed anti-tank anti, uh, weapons, you could be handed, you know, M50s, M60s, and even stuff bigger. You know, the, the big bad boy, the minigun, just, just puts a smile on a combat guy's face, because you just pull the trigger and the enemy vaporizes, you know. You don't give that to private. You don't give that to someone who's not a veteran, combat, hardened individual that knows when and when not to pull the trigger, okay? And so we have a lot of people in the body of Christ that think they understand their authority, but they haven't, but authority is elevated with consecration. And so they go out on the battlefield, and the only thing the Holy Spirit's given them is a peace shooter because that's all they can, they've not even worked their way up to a BB gun yet. And they're thinking they're rolling out on the spiritual warfare battlefield in a tank and all they have is a peace shooter because of the way that we have preached spiritual warfare. The armor is never going to give you that which will kill you or hurt others. He's going to give you, as you mature, the power of using the name of Jesus. Now listen to me. We expect demons to submit to us when we use that name. But they look in our hearts and they say, why should I submit to that name when you're not? You have all this part of your life, that's a majority part of your life, that we still control and you listen to us and yet you want us to bow the knee when you use the name of Jesus and you refuse to bow the knee. You see, the reason the separation between the seven sons of Sceva and Paul was not only that Paul was saved, and they most likely weren't, but his level of consecration to the kingdom. Paul gave up a lot to walk with Messiah, and he matured. And he was walking at a level that they could see so much of the kingdom in him, they knew they had better bow the knee when he used the name. Can you see the difference in the armory? 
That's why we've we got to put off the old. And part of the life of consecration is constantly, of sanctification, is constantly putting off the old junk and putting on Christ as I learn him in the word of God. I see him in the commandments. I see Jesus in every single bolt and nut of the, of the tabernacle of Moses. Every, but I also see me because it's built within me. Because as his work is manifested in me, I'll match him. Come on, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so it's, it's constantly putting off and putting on. And I tell you what, Mike Lake has had a lot of attitude, uh, attitudinal adjustments, you know. Where I get an attitude and the Holy Spirit says, sit down, boy, we need to talk. Because we've got to watch because it, 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 what comes in as a bad attitude can spring into a lot of other things. It needs to be brought underneath the blood. We have to have a soul that is consecrated to Jesus, learning to walk in the Spirit and by the Spirit. And when we do, it begins eradicating the works of the flesh, and we begin cultivating the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And until we understand that dynamic, you can talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit your whole life, but you'll have nothing but nut fruits and flakes in your life because it'll be the carnal nature. You know, we always talk about granola Christianity. Nut fruits and flakes are always produced by the flesh and never by the Spirit. we got to put on Christ. <clears throat> Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Verse, or for Romans chapter 13 starting in verse 11. If there was ever a time that this scripture is appropriate of waking up out of sleep, it's right now. And I believe that the remnant are waking up all around the world. They're smelling the spiritual coffee. And they're waking up. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For our salvation, for, it, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Notice the, the dichotomy here. You've got to cast off before you can put on. The armor of God can only be placed where the character of Christ has been forged in your life. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. That is a commandment, not a suggestion. How many know the New Testament is full of commandments? You are commanded to put off the works of the flesh, and you are commanded to put on Christ, and if you don't, it is sin. And that sin is causing you not to have answered prayers. That sin is allowing the devil to eat up your life, and you go run into God all the time, and, but you won't change. You won't put off and put on, and you're wondering why the devil always gets in. You've got to push him out the door. You've got to seal that door through repentance, and you've got to open the door through God through obedience. It's time for us to wake up not only spiritually, but we need to wake up to the spiritual dynamic. Everything that we, everything that we think, say, and do are spiritual gateways to our lives. Mm -hmm. We've got to bring our thinking into captivity. I tell you what, there's a lot of times I take myself by the ear and I say, Mike Lake, you're not going to think like that. I police my thinking. Yeah. Just because it flows through my head doesn't mean it's a good idea. Because when you understand the dynamic of, of how the second heaven and the soul works, the second heaven can bombard you with ideas and feelings. And they know every easy button that you have. Our task is to take all those away. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold, bringing captive every thought. We need to start filtering our thoughts. How do you do that? I grab that thought. Mike Lake will not think that. And I begin to tell Mike Lake how he feels and what he is going to do and what he's going to think. I remember listening to Lester Summerall. And I, 
You know, there's, there's some guys that, uh, there's a reason Lester Sumrall was able to do so much, I think, in his ministry. It's because of some of the men that he got to learn under. He was able to move powerfully in the gifts of the Holy Spirit because he, he mentored under Howard Carter, who brought the understanding of the gifts of the Spirit back to the body of Christ. And then he started hanging around a guy named Smith Wigglesworth. When Smith Wigglesworth grew old and was in hip, the body of Christ kind of set him over there and just kind of let him out of the box every once in a while. You know, you embarrass us with your boldness. It, guys, we, we, if we become so sophisticated, we get embarrassed by boldness, we need to repent. And so Lester, when he was over in, in Europe, found out where Smith Wigglesworth lived and began to go a couple of times a week to fellowship with him. And one day, Lester just got aggravated at Smith Wigglesworth. He said, man, don't you ever have a bad day because it's like he was properly dressed. Every hair was in place. A big smile was on his face. He was giving glory to God. It didn't matter if it was raining outside, gloomy outside, sunny outside. He was the same every single day. And it, it actually kind of perturbed Lester Summerall in his, in his youth. And he, sa he said, Brother Wigglesworth, he said, don't you ever have a bad day? And he said, he said, Wigglesworth got this real stern look on his face. And he said, I don't ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels every day. I tell him how he's going to feel. That old man, the minute he woke up, he got out of bed and he would start dancing in his bedroom praising God. And he said, sometimes in the morning when I get up, stuff hurts, but the dancing works it out. He learned the secret of taking thoughts captive because your thought life and your emotions are very fickle. You see, I can tell you a sad story about a puppy and I can get you crying. Or I can tell you, a, I, I can manipulate your emotions. TV does it all the time. How many of us have, were, were, were so full that you couldn't, har you couldn't hardly hold another bite than they put a food at on the, and all of a sudden you're starving to death? Your feet, all this stuff is just fickle. But the kingdom of God is unmovable. And we need to start learning the kingdom of God is a fixed point. The word does not change. God does not change. The spirit of God does not change. And I need to begin living my life by that fixed point. And I bring everything else subjected to, into subjection to that point. And God gives me the grace to do it. That's why we're under grace. Not a legalism that we try to beat ourselves up until it comes there, but that grace gives us the authority to begin bringing everything into subjection to Christ. That's walking in the Spirit. Let's go to chapter uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 37. Once I get this established of what this means to begin functioning and developing the fruit of the Spirit, then we can actually get into the fruit of the Spirit. But if you don't know this dynamic, it'll never work. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible because I think the Amplified Bible just did a real neat job of translating this. And Jesus called to him the throng with his disciples and said to them, If anyone intends to come after me, let him deny himself, forget Ignore, disown, and lose sight of himself and his own interests. Nine times out of ten, our own interests are carnal interests, aren't they? And take up his cross and join me as a disciple and siding with my party. Uh-oh. There went being a Democrat or a Republican. How many know Jesus has a party? The Jesus party. Follow with me, continually cleaving steadfast to me, for whosoever wants to save his higher spiritual eternal life will lose the lower natural temporal life which is lived only on earth. And whoever gives up his life which is lived only on the earth for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it his higher spiritual life in the eternal kingdom of God. For what, do, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life in the eternal kingdom of God. Now the church has lost this understanding. When we lost kingdom and being different, the word of God says, be ye holy as I am holy, and that's New Testament. Under grace, 
we are called to be holy as he is holy. And when you understand the, the, the concept of, of kadosh, of, of being holy, God is the absolute other of anything that this world understands. And if I start being and walking in this other kingdom, I'm the absolute other. I'm not like the world. And we have had a church that has lost that understanding. And now we're trying to be relevant to the world by being like the world. We want to dress like the world. We got to have tats like the world. We got to have our music like the world. We got to use the same lingo like the world so that we can fit in. We're not supposed to fit in. We're supposed to be absolutely different from the world. Otherwise, we lose our relevancy. Because it's in the difference where the power is. When there is a contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, those in darkness begin to see the light. But if we try, but you know what happens when you try to put on darkness to be relevant? You begin dimming the light. And that is where the modern church is today. We think that through the carnal things of this world that we're going to attract. And one of the things we're finding out is the millennials and all that are beginning to see through that and they don't want it. And it's beginning to be a conundrum for the modern church. That's why we've got to return back to the old waste places and, and the places to walk in. And we've we, we got to reestablish the things of God and that we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be like Jesus. Jesus did not fit in with the people of his day. What makes you think he's going to fit in with the people of this day? He doesn't follow a trend. He sets the trend. And I found out that when you begin to get into that trend, the kingdom of God begins to flow, and things begin to change, and darkness backs off. And isn't that what we need? Isn't that what we need in our lives? Come on, we've we got to learn how to grab hold of this. Let go of this lower life. It doesn't matter what the world thinks about us. You know, I've heard people in the secular that have had Christians working for them. And I mean, these were uncompromising Christians, but they learned how to move in the wisdom of God. And... They'll tell you, say, you know, sometimes the guy's irritating because he's uncompromising. And sometimes he's the, the board, he's the splinter on the board. But when push comes to shove, he has ideas that work. And when everybody else is looking out for their own back, he does the right thing or she does the right thing. And it begins to cause them to stand out. Because the world at the, will have this love-hate relationship. We love your integrity and how that you can move in wisdom, but it convicts us. And then opens the door for you to show them a better way. That's the position the church should be in, but because the church has wanted to become relevant with this weird idea that we've had, we've become powerless in America. We have let satanic pedophiles take over this nation and it is time to return back to the ways of God to repent and to become light in the world again and salt in this nation again and take it back and it will and it will be done through lives beginning to blaze in the power of God that can begin standing in that third heaven before the court of God and asking almighty God to judge and that's a position of maturity. And we have to have saints that are mature, that have so much a Messiah in them that they can stand before that court. And the prosecuting attorney can't bring allegation against them. But the tables are turned where we say, you know, the one, one most guilty in this court is the prosecuting attorney. Hasatan, because he's the one doing all this stuff in the earth. And we ask the court to judge against the prosecuting attorney. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is not so necessary. That's why the consecration is so necessary. We have stopped being light and salt. We've quit preaching truth. We've quit letting the gospel really work in the lives of people. 
because we've not told them to repent. We have a powerless gospel today. We have a gospel that we have churches full of people that are not even saved because you can't get saved until you're taught to repent and you've got to be taught why you need to repent and why a Savior had to come and how you have to absolutely yield to Him to be saved. The concept of saying Jesus is Lord is more than just a little prayer. It's a life commitment. He's Lord, I'm not. I bow the knee. He's in control, I'm not. And when we do that and we enter into this relationship to where he becomes the one who teaches me, I become his disciple. And I wake up to the fact that there is a really old guy that was his disciple. His name was Moses. Messiah discipled Moses. And Moses got to hanging around him so much. And he was, when, 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 when Almighty God called Moses to Israel, he said, you're going to be like a God to them because what I tell them, you, I tell you, you tell them, you hang around me. He said, listen, there's one coming who's going to be just like me because you see him in me. You've heard his words out of my mouth. You've seen his glory on my face. And when he comes, you better hear what he says, because if you don't, you're not going to be held guiltless. His name was Jesus. Jesus discipled Moses from the burning bush forward. It was Jesus in the burning bush. It was Jesus that brought the plagues on Egypt. It was Jesus that parted the Red Sea. It was Jesus that set Mount Sinai on fire. It was Jesus that was the pillar by day and the the pillar of fire by night. It was Jesus. And he mentored Moses. That same God is saying, let me mentor you. Oh, he's waiting to make you into what you can only become when he's the one doing the molding. The best you possible. The best dad, the best wife, the best, uh, uh, the best mother, the best person. Someone who can make a difference wherever you are. He's waiting just to mold you. But he's saying, yield to me. Let me help you put off so that you can put on me. So that we can, in true honesty, call ourselves Christians. It was used in Antioch as a slang that the pagans were doing, saying you're running around being, this being like a bunch of little Jesuses. Just trying to act like Jesus. Just trying to perform miracles like Jesus. Just trying to preach like Jesus. Can we really say that today with the name Christian? Or has it become to mean something else? Let's return to our roots. And let's be like him by putting him on. And begin developing the fruit that can only happen when we abide in him. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that it will not return to us void. Are you void? But Father, it will accomplish where unto you have sent it. And Father, give us grace to reach for that higher life. Give us grace to put off the old life. Give us grace to enter into this discipleship that the creator of the universe has called us to be mentored by him. And that his spirit is just waiting here, ready to lead us, to guide us, and to make this word come alive. And Father, we thank you for it. Let it be so, we ask in Jesus' name.